Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Gregory Peck and Virginia Mayo in Captain Horatio Hornblower. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. From time immemorial, stories of the sea have held a fascination for everyone, particularly those of the great naval battles before the days of modern warfare. Tonight, we bring you Captain Horatio Hornblower, adapted from the famous tales of C.S. Forrester, and tell you the story of a hero in the days of Britain's dominance of the seas. As our stars... We present the handsome and talented team of Gregory Peck and Virginia Mayo, recreating their original roles in this Warner Brothers screen adventure, which, by the way, can still be seen at your favorite neighborhood theater. And I believe there's still a rumor going around that a sailor has a girl in every port. Well, now, that's not so surprising, knowing that girls all over the world can purchase Lux toilet soap. Yes, you can sail the seven seas and find Lux girls. Because women everywhere are devoted to Lux Toilet Soap for their complexion care. The curtain rises on Captain Horatio Hornblower, starring Gregory Peck in the title role, and Virginia Mayo as Lady Barbara. In the year 1807, a small ship of the Royal Navy, His Majesty's ship Lydia, set forth on a secret destination. With five million French and Spanish soldiers poised on the continent under Napoleon, nothing could save England from invasion except her 300 ships. But the Lydia was sailing far from Europe. We'd been at sea now for seven weary months, and it covered 10,000 miles. But only one man aboard knew our destination and what we would do when and if we got there. Captain Hornblower. Our stores of food and water were all but exhausted. The day came when I felt duty-bound to speak up. I think I know what you've come to tell me, Mr. Bush. There are 39 men sick and off duty. Scurvy. Yes, sir. And eight dead. Nine dead, Mr. Bush. Hazlitt died a few moments ago. Hazlitt? I... I didn't know, sir. He was a good topman. Forgive me, sir, but we've got to put ashore for food and fresh water. The Lydia will stay at sea until we reach our destination. Sir, I don't know what our mission is. All I know is that three more days of this, I can't answer for the life of anyone aboard. Mr. Bush, you may tell all hands that we'll reach our destination within two days. C- Captain? It will be identified by a fortress on a hill overlooking a large bay. I'll tell him at once. I'll be obliged if you'll hand me the ship's log. <laughs> yes, sir. Here it is, sir. That is all, Mr. Bush. Thank you. I have sent word to the crew that our voyage is almost ended. I tell them this only to keep hope alive. I pray God my calculations are correct. It must come, or we shall all surely die. That next day, just before dark, the miracle occurred. A sight that brought every man on deck, chinning like lunatics. Land ho! Off the starboard bow! Land ho! Land ho! You were right, sir. Within two days, you said. Report to the helmsman, Mr. Bush. We'll bear to starboard and let the wind take her. Ah, sir. Mr. Gerard? Aye, aye, sir. This ship is getting slack, Mr. Gerard. It's taking you longer every day to clear for action. The hands are weak, sir. And what? Well, restless, sir. Seven months without sighting land until until now, sir. An officer who cannot control his men is not reliable. Uh, Yes, sir. Took you 11 minutes and 20 seconds to clear for action this morning. I want it done in 10. Now... No, sir. You seem to have your mind on something else, Mr. Gerard. I said now. Uh, aye, aye, sir. <laughs> you can cut out my liver, sir, if anybody else in the whole bloody Navy could have done it. 10,000 miles and you hit it right on the nose. Well, uh, we'll know more in the morning. Meanwhile, let me remind you that this is still a ship of war. 
We'll drop anchor in the bay, Mr. Bush, and ride out the night. Through the mists of the following morning, we saw the fortress, testifying to the incredible navigation of Captain Hornblower. We'd been sighted from the shore. A dozen men in a longboat were rowing out to us. The ship cleared for action, Mr. Bush? Yes, sir. Ten minutes and three seconds. Sir. My compliments to Mr. Gerard. Uh, that boat, sir? They are His Majesty's allies, Mr. Bush. Allies, sir? Don Julian Alvarado, a prince of this country, has been persuaded to revolt against Spain. Then our cargo of arms is for him? If Don Julian can conquer Central America and his chances look promising, Spain will have to take ships and men from Napoleon to preserve these colonies. Prepare to take our callers aboard, Mr. Bush. <laughs> Twenty minutes later, they stood on our deck. Dark, ugly men with a great show of arrogance. I'm Don Jose Hernandez, admiral in the service of El Supremo. You're Captain Hornblower? I am. You uh, said El Supremo, senor. Well, that means the Almighty. El Supremo was formerly known to men as Don Julian Alvarado. <laughs> And uh, where is this, uh, this Supremo? In his fortress. You will come with me now. I'll be ready in a moment, Mr. Bush. Sir. Here are the keys to my dispatch box. The box contains the Admiralty's instructions. If I am not back by midnight, you will assume command. Not back, sir. But you said they were our friends. You have your orders, Mr. Bush. Captain El Supremo. Sir, you are Hornblower. Yes, senor. King George of England charges me with messages of his friendship. I am not interested in the words of a mere king. <clears throat> Have you brought me the guns and powder for my conquest of the Americas? A thousand muskets, a million rounds of ammunition, and cannon for your fort, senor. Human beings do not address me, senor. Make arrangements with Admiral Hernandez for landing your cargo. I will hand over nothing until my ship is reprovisioned. I have given you an order. Outside this fort, you saw the bodies of 50 men hanging by their feet. They, too, disobeyed me. If I am not back aboard my ship within one hour, she will train her guns on this fort and reduce it to rubble. With you here? No, I think not. That is my order. Such earthly matters are beneath me. We are allies. What are your needs? I have a written list of everything I want, but not one musket until our needs have been filled. Take it, Hernandez. Start now. When you have landed my weapons, I will move first to San Salvador and burn it. Perhaps you will accompany us. No, my orders are to blockade Panama. It is your loss. A burning city is a magnificent sight. El Supremo! El Supremo! You dare to enter without knocking! But El Supremo is most important. Uh, another ship has been sighted from the South Supremo, the, the Natividad. You are in luck, Capitan. A visitor from Panama. Oh, an ally? I hardly think so. Three months ago, the Spanish Viceroy sent a diplomat. He warned me to curb my political ambitions. In answer, I sent part of him back to Panama. His head... To be precise. Oh, then the Spanish already know of your plan. This visitor comes to destroy us. She's a ship of 60 guns. When does she arrive? Lopez. He's still a great distance away, not before dawn, Supremo. I must take measures to prepare my ship, see that my provisions are sent out immediately. After which you will capture the Natividad and turn it over to me. You make it sound very simple, senor. Any ship I capture belongs to my king. Your king does not wish to offend me. You were told to aid me in my conquest of the Americas. I cannot surrender a British prize without authority from the Admiralty. With two ships, we could crush all of Central America. Take the Englishman back to his ship. Consider carefully, Captain Hornblower. My friend, my ally. What a ship of 60 guns, sir. Huh? She finds us here at Hankel. We're in the lee of a great point of land, Mr. Bush. Now, here in this bay will not be sighted. Send your best lookout ashore. Station him at the top of the hill. You can keep us informed of the Spaniards' whereabouts. Meanwhile, we'll take on provisions and discharge our cargo. If those are your orders... I have very little choice, Mr. Bush. We are without food, and our rear is a Spanish man of war. Before us is a fortress with a hundred cannon, commanded by a madman. We'll remain where we are and take our chances. With the coming of darkness, our lookout signaled his last message from the shore. 
the Natividad had dropped anchor. She'd risk no battle with the fortress, not at night and in strange waters. A moment later, the officers of the Lydia were summoned to Captain Hornblow's cabin. Come in, gentlemen, come in. Ah, we'll have supper and then a game of whist, eh? Supper, sir? Yes, beef, Mr. Gerard. Compliments of El Supremo. Did you say whist, sir? Well, I'm prepared to lose, gentlemen. I've already won a bigger gamble. The Natividad has decided to drop anchor. It was my one hope. You mean we're leaving, sir? Slipping out in the dark? I mean that we now have a chance to capture the Natividad without a battle, without firing a cannon. The Spaniard has no knowledge of our presence here. Now, shortly after midnight, when the tide's in our favor, we'll lower our boats and attempt to take her by surprise. Now, Mr. Polwheel... Aye, sir. While their mouths are still gaping, suppose we feed them some dinner. By midnight, he was in a far more sober mood. Again and again, we rehearsed every step of the surprise attack. And then, with oars muffled, we rode through the darkness. The fight was brief. In a matter of minutes, the Natividad was ours. All hands accounted for, sir. Six wounded, none dead. Very good, Mr. Bush. Tell Mr. Longley to take the wounded back to the Lydia. Aye, uh, sir. You are captain of this ship, senor? I am. You, uh, you may retain your sword. Mr. Gerard, you will remove this gentleman and his officers to the Lydia and put them in irons. But we have surrendered, senor. There are articles of war. Mm. Tomorrow morning, Don Julian Alvarado will be coming aboard this ship. If he so much as sees an officer, he'll have you all killed. And those are his articles of war. Stand by, Mr. Bush. I want to look at this ship. She's a beauty, sir. Worth at least 120,000 guineas. It gives every man in the crew 50 guineas prize money. Uh, Tividad is not a prize ship. Uh, I beg your pardon, sir. She's to be used by our ally, Don Julian. You're giving her away. But, sir, your own share had come to at least 10,000. I asked for no figures. But, sir, you said yourself that Don Julian's man. I alone will have to answer to the Admiralty for this decision. Now get your party together and we'll go below. Good morning, senor. Welcome aboard. We've been expecting you. You greet me with 11 guns. The correct salute for El Supremo Capitan is 23 guns. King himself receives only 21. That is why I always have 23. Uh, About last night, you kill many? No, I, uh, I didn't want to deprive you of your crew, Supremo. I shall kill the officers and then replace them with my own. Where are they? Oh, uh, well, I, I, uh, I greatly regret that I threw them overboard earlier this morning. Uh, with their hands and feet tied, of course. Oh, that is a pity. We shall sail north from here tonight. You will proceed south to blockade Panama. As those were my orders, senor, I shall lose no time in fulfilling them. Assemble forces, Mr. Bush. We're returning to the Lydia. Both ships cleared the bay that night. Our crew was angry. They'd lost their prize money given away by their captain to an insane killer. We were still grumbling about it five days later when we picked up a small lugger flying the Spanish colors and a white flag. Among those aboard were two women and a colonel named Intensa. Oh, thank heaven we found you in time, Capitan Hornblower. I should still like to know why you're carrying a white flag. Capitan Hornblower, I welcome you as the new ally of Spain. Ally? For a month now. Your country and mine have been brothers in arms against Napoleon. Oh, perhaps you think my news is too good to be true, huh? Here, then, senor, a letter from your own admiralty. A letter? <clears throat> Thank you. As you will see for yourself, senor, Napoleon kidnapped our king and put his own brother on the throne of Spain. Our government in exile immediately concluded an alliance with Great Britain. I sought you out immediately. So easily you might have fallen afoul of our warship, the Natividad. It uh, so happened, sir, that last week we did encounter in the Natividad. Madre de Dios. And captured her. Senor, surely you are joking. Mr. Longley. Aye, sir. You will take Colonel Intenza below. I think he'd like a word or two with the captain of the Natividad. And now may I be allowed to say something? <laughs> My name is Wellesley, Captain. Lady Barbara Wellesley. W- Wellesley? What? You, you're not related to the Duke of Wellington. He's my brother. Oh, but, 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 but... You, ma'am, on a, on a... 
On a, on a Spanish lugger? There's yellow fever in Panama. When Colonel Intenza set out in search of you, he was kind enough to allow me to go with him. Oh, but in the name of all common sense, ma'am, why? Because I require passage to England for myself and my maid. Aboard the Lydia? What other British ship is in these waters, sir? Do you suggest we swim home? I suggest that your ladyship get back aboard that lugger, that you cross the isthmus and embark on a ship which has frills and fancies enough for women passengers. Captain Hornblower, last week a thousand people died in Panama of yellow fever. Uh, may I ask why you were there in the first place? Because the British packet I was sailing on was captured by the Spaniards. And I must say I was treated by the enemy with more courtesy than I have so far received from the captain of His Majesty's ship, Lydia. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Captain Hornblower... It cannot be true. It's an actividad. You, you gave her to the rebel, to Alvarado? I did exactly that, senor. But you already were our ally. Do you realize what you have done? We have no other ship of war in the Pacific. They will burn our ports, bombard our city. Yes, I am well aware of the situation. Your ladyship, this removes any possibility of your remaining aboard. Indeed. I have no choice but to pursue the natividad. We'll be engaging a ship twice our size. If we're defeated... You'll be in the hands of a butchering maniac. And if I return to Panama, I'll probably die of the fever. Since there's a good chance of death in either case, I must insist on making the choice but, myself. But you, you don't seem to re... But... <laughs> Mr. Gerard, Lady Wellesley will be moving into my cabin. I must ask you to return to your lugger at once, Colonel. Mr. Bush? Yes, sir. Get this ship underway. I want every stitch of canvas she'll carry. I hope I'll not be disturbing the ship's routine, Mr. Gerard. Oh, no, no uh, not in the least, ma'am. <clears throat> I'm afraid your captain thinks otherwise. He's got a lot on his mind, ma'am. If he doesn't retake the Natividad, he's in for serious trouble. Surely it isn't his fault that Spain changed sides in the war? I'm afraid the Admiralty won't stop to consider that, ma'am. You're fond of the captain, aren't you? Ma'am, he's, he's the best officer in the service. He's a better sailor than Mr. Bush, a better gunner than Mr. Longley, and <laughs> when it comes to navigation, ma'am, I don't hold a candle to him. Begging your pardon, ma'am, and that's not all. He's as gentle and warm-hearted as any man it's who's ever... It's Gerard! Gentle and warm-hearted. I see what you mean. How are you? Excuse me, ma'am. Mr. Bush! I'll have you remind everyone aboard that this is still a ship of war. Now, clear away! <laughs> In a few moments, we'll return with Act Two of Captain Horatio Hornblower. Now, here's Libby Collins with the Lux Movie News of the Week. Hi, John. Hi. The picture in the news tonight is one that will keep you chuckling from start to finish. It's Warner Brothers' newest comedy, Room for One More. Oh, that's the picture that stars Cary Grant and Betsy Drake. Mm -hmm. They make a wonderful husband and wife team. They certainly do, John. In a house full of children and comic situations. Papa Carey and Mama Betsy are blessed with three offspring of their own, and they adopt two more. A brave and wealthy couple. No, John, just an average couple who believe that children make a home. There's laughs and tears and a lot of love in room for one more. It's such a wonderful, scrub-behind-the-ears sort of movie. With our big bath-sized Lux, I trust. <laughs> but of course... And Lux lovely Betsy Drake is absolutely endearing as the young mother. She's always so fresh-looking. Betsy told me that after working all day with five little dynamos, she really needed a beauty pickup and appreciated her Lux soap beauty bath more than ever. That's a beauty trick every young mother should learn. And every young girl. In that creamy Lux lather, the tiredness seems to float away. Your spirits get a refreshing lift. Your skin gets a beauty treatment. That's because Lux Lather is active, cleanses gently but so thoroughly that it makes your skin softer and smoother. Makes you feel Lux Lovely all over. Especially so because the delicate Lux fragrance clings for so long. I hope all the women in our audience will take this beauty tip from lovely Betsy Drake. Try Lux Toilet Soap in the big bath size cake. Discover for yourself how easy it is to be Lux Lovely. You'll see why nine out of ten screen stars are Lux girls. Now our producer, Mr. William Keeley. Act two of Captain Horatio Hornblower, starring Gregory Peck in the title role and Virginia Mayo as Lady Barbara. (laughs) 
Our course was now southerly in pursuit of the Natividad. Each day the glances of the crew lingered longer and more openly on Lady Barbara Wellesley and her maid. And each day Captain Hornblower became more irritable. I will tell you once again, Mr. Bush, we are not on a pleasure cruise. Our lives and our passengers' lives depend upon this ship being properly handled. You will inform her ladyship... There'll be no need to inform me, Mr. Bush. Captain Hornblower has a way of making himself heard even above the wind. All I ask, ma'am, is that you use a little more discretion. Can two women really be so distracting, Captain? May I remind you, ma'am, that my men have been continually at sea for more than seven months. And you, sir? How long have you been at sea? I what? I... <clears throat> Sail ho! Sail off the larboard bow! Sail ho! The Natividad, sir. We've overtaken her. Mr. Gerard, conduct Lady Barbara and her maid to the cable tier. They will remain there until the action is over. Port your helm. Keep as close to the wind as she'll lie. The cable tier, Mr. Gerard? What if I refuse? I should then have to carry you, ma'am. Orders, my lady. You'd get me shot if you didn't. I shouldn't want to do that, Mr. Jones. Mr. Longley, beat to quarters. Clear for action. Aye, aye, sir. Beat to quarters. Don Julian will be in for quite a shock, sir, when he gets his 23-gun salute broadside. Oh, I'm afraid not, Mr. Bush. They're running out their cannon. Looks as though he's heard the news, too. Yeah, she's got twice our gun and twice our men. We can't stand off and pound them. We can't go in and board them. Well, that makes our decision very simple, Mr. Bush. We'll have to outsail her and hit when she can't hit back. Pass the word, Mr. Bush. Starboard battery, load and stand by. That's a... Starboard battery, load and stand by. <laughs> It was not our guns that sunk the Natividad that day, nor the bravery of our crew, so much as the skill and the instinct of the man who led us. A man who knew wind and sail and water so intimately that in his hands the Lydia was almost human, dodging, fainting, healing, wheeling, and all the while pouring a deadly fire into the heart of the enemy, till she disappeared beneath the waves. It, it was a great victory, sir. The men, I should like a word with the men. Yes, sir. All hands, tense up. All hands, tense up. Our mission in the Pacific is finished, gentlemen. Thank you for the manner in which you've all carried out your duties. Your conduct today will be brought to the attention of the Admiralty. You had a right to hope for prize money. In that regard, I've failed you. You'll find us another prize, sir. It's a big ocean. Yeah. Well, there's, there's little left that I can offer you except my gratitude and, and a double ration of rum all round. Dismissed. Yay! Mr. Gerard? Sir? I told you I wanted decks cleared for action in ten minutes. You did it in eight. I'm much obliged. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Well, she's a sorry-looking ship, Mr. Gerard. Give us a couple of weeks, sir. She'll be as good as new again. Hmm. Well, clear the wreckage as quickly as you can. How many dead, Mr. Bush? It'll be close to 20, sir. 20 dead. Well, I'll go below and see the wounded. Yes, sir. Oh, who's with them? McRae, sir. Bush again. And her... her ladyship, sir. What? Uh, she insisted on helping, sir. There are so many. She's down there in all that mess? There was no stopping her, sir. Why, she disobeyed orders. She's a stubborn woman, Mr. Bush. Uh, yes, sir. For which the wounded and I give profound thanks. Good afternoon, Lady Wellesley. Good afternoon, Captain. I haven't had the opportunity yet to properly thank you for everything you did for the men. You were very busy that day. You don't have to thank me. You're trembling. Have you a chill, your ladyship? It's just the strain of the past week. Hmm. Well, I don't wonder what you saw was never meant for woman's eyes. But I did see, Captain. And I know there's not another officer in the Navy who could have done what you've done on this voyage. Well, I'm glad you think so, your ladyship. My maid. Please, if you would call my maid. Your ladyship. Oh, I'm afraid I'm ill, Captain. I'm afraid oh, I... But, Mr. Bush... Mr. Longley, her ladyship, uh, give me a hand. She's 
still unconscious, sir. Could the maid tell you anything? The maid's hysterical. She says it's the fever. Yellow fever from Panama. Maybe she's right, sir. And our surgeon dead. Bring me the medical books from the sick bay and, and more blankets. But don't come in. Just push them inside the door. If it's yellow fever, this cabin will have to be quarantined. What else could it be, sir? I don't know, but swamp fever and yellow fever have the same symptoms in the beginning. When... when will you know? Well, if it's swamp fever, her temperature will break in 72 hours. If it's yellow fever, I... Mm, well, just bring me those books, Mr. Bush. Three days later, the men had occasion to cheer once again. Lady Barbara was going to recover. And for the first time in those three days, Captain Hornblower left her cabin. He called for Mr. Paul Wheel to bring his razor and shave. You've got a happy ship again, Captain, sir. The men are that fond of her ladyship, sir. To say nothing of the black mark they'd be against us if anything happened to the Duke of Wellington's sister... It, it, it wouldn't set so well with Mucho Pomposo either, sir. Mucho Pomposo? Oh, uh, I, I beg your pardon, sir. I meant Admiral Layton, the man she's going to marry, sir. Marry? Well, who told you that, Mr. Powell? A ladyship's maid, sir. They're to be married as soon as she gets back to England. Will that be all, sir? Yes, sir. that's all, Powell. Thank you. Please sit down, Captain. I just stop by to see how you're feeling this morning. Much better. Thanks to my doctor. <laughs> I did no more than read a medical book, your ladyship. And go without sleep for 72 hours. Yes, I know. Mr. Polwheel told me. Well, Mr. Polwheel might have added that that's not at all unusual for a sailor, your ladyship. I do wish you'd call me Lady Barbara instead of your ladyship. Well, if you wish, ma'am, thank you. Of course, if Lady Barbara doesn't come easily to you and you wish to attract my attention, you can always say... <clears throat> You know, you're very observant. No one's ever noticed that before. <laughs> no one, I'm sure. Except every man aboard the ship. When should we reach England, Captain? Uh, in the spring, Lady Barbara. It will take that long. Well, I, I know how anxious you must be to get home again. I'll do my best, Lady Barbara. I'm sure you will. Thank you. A few nights later, I saw them together. They were standing at the rail, looking out across the sea toward England. How beautiful the stars are tonight. It's as though we were sailing the heavens instead of the sea. Well, in a way we are. We steer from star to star rather than from land to land. You never forget you're the captain of a ship, do you? <laughs> no. A ship's captain cannot afford to forget. On a night like this, I can forget everything. Who I am, where I come from, where I'm going. I only know that the Lydia is sailing on and on into space. There is no other world, and this voyage will never end. It will end sooner than I thought. Is that what you really want? A quick passage? Uh, it's getting late. There'll soon be a chill in the air. These tropical nights are deceptive. I don't want a quick passage. I don't want this voyage to end. How much longer are we going to pretend? Barbara... You I... must know I love you. Why do you fight against it? I... I'm... married, Lady Barbara. Married? Oh, you'll forgive me. I've made a terrible mistake. I'm deeply ashamed. No, wait. No, no, please. Let me go. Stay here and speed your ship home with me. For two weeks, they avoided each other. But as we sped closer and closer to England, so were they drawn closer to each other. Mr. Bush said that we're nearing land, and I saw some seagulls. Yes, those seagulls sleep in England. The weather holds, we'll sight Plymouth by morning. Plymouth by morning. Oh, my love. Barbara. I have no longing for the land. Nor I. I've known from the first, I think, when you tried to make me leave the ship. All captain and no heart, I thought. 
Now every mile closer to England is agony for me. What are we to do? Do? We're lovers and the world is ours. But we're not free, Barbara. Either of us. Do you really believe it can end here? In this one moment? It must. I see. It, it isn't easy for me to say. Please, try to understand. Good night, Captain Hornblower. Good night, Lady Barbara. The next morning, we dropped anchor in Plymouth Harbor. An honor was waiting our ship. The first from shore to board her was an admiral, Sir Rodney Layton. Captain Hornblower, at your service, sir. Lady Wellesley is aboard, is she not? She's been informed of your arrival, sir. Well, you return a famous man, Captain Hornblower. Of course, it's my personal belief that you were very fortunate to sink the Natividad, having first given her away. And on your own initiative, I believe. It seemed the best thing to do at the time, sir. But really, Hornblower, giving away a 60-gun prize to a madman... I stand ready to answer for my actions, sir. In addition, sir. you risk the life of the Duke of Wellington's sister. I apologize for that, sir. I, too, value Lady Barbara highly. We're going to be married. Yes, so Lady Barbara has told me, sir. Yes, I suppose a ship of this size is rather confining and confidence is freer than under normal circumstances. Oh, here you are at last, my dear... How good of you to come aboard. You've no idea how concerned I've been for your welfare. That was sweet of you, but you had no reason to worry. I'm glad to hear that. Well, shall we go? Your family awaits you impatiently in London. Yes, of course. Goodbye, Captain Hornblower. Lady Barbara. Thank you for your... for your kindness. Turn shut! This was the end of our voyage. That night, Captain Hornblower entered his home for the first time in more than a year. But the wife he'd come back to was gone. If only you could have come back sooner, Captain, to be here in time. What are you trying to tell me, Mrs. McPhee? She's dead, sir. Died in childbed, sir, given your son. Dead? Oh, she so wanted to live, sir, at least until you returned. She, she left this for you, sir. It was on her deathbed she wrote it. Thank you. Where is the child? In here, sir. He's sleeping, sir. A good, strong lad, Captain. I, I'd like to be alone with him, Mrs. McPhee. Yes, sir, of course, sir. Not knowing where you are, I cannot send these last words to you. But I pray you will come back to read them. Do not forget me completely when I'm gone. Though we've been married for 15 years, in In all all that that time, time, we were together for only 15 months. One Christmas, two birthdays. But I am not sorry for the years. I know you have not loved me deeply, but I have loved you more for never betraying it to me. Maybe you have saved your love for our son. Come to him soon. Your devoted wife, Maria. Several days later, I met Captain Hornblow at the Admiralty in London. It was there that I learned of his wife's death of his son, and of his well-deserved promotion. He was now to command a ship of 74 guns. She'd been captured from the French and renamed the Sutherland. We've uh, been assigned Admiral Leighton's squadron, Mr. Bush. Leighton, sir. (sighs) Then he's back from his honeymoon. Mm. Lord Hood believes that Napoleon has bitten off more than he can chew in the Spanish Peninsula. The Duke of Wellington has an excellent chance to defeat him if the Navy can maintain the blockade. Our orders are that not a single French ship must sail. And when do we sail, sir? Well, I should know that shortly. All captains are reporting now to Admiral Leighton. 
If you can meet me... Captain Hornblower. Oh, Lady Barbara. Uh, I'm at the Stanley Arms, sir. Uh, it's not far off. Oh, thank you, Bush. I hoped we'd meet. I wanted to tell you how sorry I was about the news you had at home. But... Thank you, Lady Barbara. I hear you have a son. Yes. He's, he's a boy to be proud of. I'm sure he is. Well, I... I... I must take my leave now. I wish you every happiness. Thank you. Goodbye, Horatio. Goodbye, Barbara. Oh, it's fortunate we're all here, gentlemen. Some startling news has just arrived. Under cover of a thick fog, four of Napoleon's ships have broken out of our blockade at Brest. Why? We must be after them at once. Any idea what course they took, sir? The only place they could go is to the Mediterranean. Now, uh, if you all look at the map, we should intercept them about, uh, about here. Four against four. The outcome is obvious. <clears throat> you, uh, you don't agree, Captain Hornblower? May I ask you where else they would go? Well, I was a bit, sir, here, to the north of Spain. Nonsense. Why should they? Napoleon's army has already been pushed deep into Spain by the Duke of Wellington. Well, then, if I were Napoleon, sir, I'd consider it a good idea to make a thrust from the northeast and come up behind the Duke. And supply them by sea. Mm, better than hauling over the Pyrenees Mountains. The French would never risk four ships on such a wild gamble. What does Napoleon care about ships, sir? I submit most urgently, sir, that instead of standing out to sea, we move north along the French coast. And I disagree. Uh, perhaps uh, we could take care of both possibilities with a wide deployment. Uh, three of us fanning out from here, and one ship inshore. Oh, good idea, Bolton. <laughs> you see, gentlemen, I've no objection to a practical suggestion. We've a war to win. Well, very well then, now, uh, who goes inshore? Which of our ships has the shallowest draft? The southern one, sir, French-built. Hmm. Oh, I see now what was influencing you, Hornblower. The prospect of a prize or two, eh? Oh, not at all, sir. I'm ordering you not to risk your ship in any way for any reason. If you sight the enemy, you'll bring the news to me, and we'll dispose of them together. Is that clear? Perfectly clear, sir. I have one request, sir. Well? I beg permission to put out to sea at once, sir. Good hunting, Hornblower. Thank you, sir. We'll be back with Act Three of Captain Horatio Hornblower in a few moments. But first, my guest for tonight, Miss Virginia Gibson. You know, she's one of the busiest young players on the Warner Brothers lot. Thank you, Mr. Keeley. Now, uh, blush prettily, Virginia, while I tell our audience. You know, Miss Gibson has that uh, devastating combination. Red hair, blue eyes, and a luxe lovely complexion. You do have me blushing and looking for a quick change of subject, like, uh, well, like the rumor that's all over Hollywood. Hmm? Well, about the coming Academy Awards. Oh. Uh, rumor has it that the Warner Brothers presentation, A Streetcar Named Desire, will be a top contender for the year's best picture. Well, the New York film critics voted it the best English language picture, with awards for the director, Ilya Kazan. And for Vivian Lee in a role opposite Marlon Brando. Now, if Mr. Kazan and Miss Lee win Oscars from the Academy... Which they're likely to. For in A Streetcar Named Desire, Vivian Lee proves once more she's a great actress. And a beautiful actress. Oh, just a look at her complexion makes me well, more devoted than ever to my Lux soap facial. It's easy to see that you're a Lux girl, Virginia. That almost goes for granted in Hollywood. I don't need to tell you that Lux toilet soap is Hollywood's favorite beauty care. With good reason. Screen stars know that daily Lux facials make skin softer, smoother, really Lux lovely. And they're so easy. You simply cream in the rich, active lather for gentle, thorough cleansing. Then rinse with warm water and splash with cold. You can see right away, John, that your skin looks really lovelier. So soft and fresh. Thank you, Virginia Gibson. Why don't you try Hollywood Beauty Care Daily Lux Soap Facials? You'll see you can be Lux lovely. Remember, nine out of ten screen stars use Lux. We pause now for station identification. This is the CBS Radio Network. The 
curtain rises on Act Three of Captain Horatio Hornblower, starring Gregory Peck in the title role and Virginia Mayo as Lady Barbara. We were bound now for the Spanish coast in search of the four French warships and under strictest orders not to engage them without Admiral Leighton. We'd been at sea less than 24 hours when we sighted a French brig. For some amazing reason, she made no attempt to run away. She must think we're French. Well, we can hardly blame her, Mr. Longley, considering we're French built. It's her signal flags that puzzle me. Just two letters, sir, M and V. Did not look out. Hmm, well, she'll start running fast enough if we don't answer. We'll port helm, Mr. Bush, and put one across her bow. Aye, uh, sir. Port your helm. Fire when ready, Mr. Giraud. Ready now, sir. Steady! Fire! She's lowering her flag, sir. Take a boat and board her, Mr. Bush. Bring her under our lee, and then I'd like a word with her captain. Lively now, we may just be wasting time. <laughs> Glad you've joined us, Mr. Bush. I'm having a little difficulty with our captain here. Oh, shall I flog it out of him, sir? No, I don't enjoy brutality, Mr. Bush. Just take him up on deck, chop off his head, and give his body to the cook. No, 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 Captain. No, no. I, I tell you what you want to know. Mm-hmm. Well, then perhaps you'll tell us what that signal means, that MV. Uh, we... It is French recognition signal. Ah, that may be very useful, Mr. Bush. Tell off a prize crew to sail the brig back to England. Brig and cargo ought to be worth 2,000 pounds, sir. Uh, what is the cargo? Oh, 40 tons of powder, sir. 100 casks of beef. 1,000 bushel loads. 1,000 bushels of... You know what that means? Hmm. A lot of horses, I'd say, sir. And horses mean cavalry. You, where were you bound? Come on, man, or I'll guillotine you here and now. Where were you bound? La Teste, Captain. The port of La Teste. There's no army near La Teste. You were going to transfer your cargo to four French ships, the ones that escaped from Brest, for an attack on Wellington in Spain. We are this, your Captain. Four warships. Mr. Bush, cram on all sail and set a course for La Teste. Are we going in alone, sir, without advising the Admiral? Oh, we've no time. I'd rather be court-martialed and let those ships get away again. You can send the French brig to look for Leighton's squadron. Yes, sir. And tell the sailmaker to make me a French flag. We stood off La Teste by early morning. A heavy fog hung like a curtain over the harbor. But if it shut the enemy from our sight, we too were protected. We're going in through the fog, Mr. Bush. Sun's coming out. By the time they're in range, that fog will be gone. Let's hope the French flag fools them, sir. <laughs> we'll know soon enough. We'll keep the gun ports closed and the crew out of sight. Aye, sir. Beat to quarters! Beat to quarters! <laughs> Forty minutes later, they rose out of the mists before us. Four gray ghosts side by side in the harbor. Slowly, steadily, we closed in. There's a magnificent sight, Mr. Bush. We load with chain shot. I want those four Frenchmen dismasted. Ah, sir. You've hoisted the pennants, Mr. Gerard? Yes, sir. MV. I believe we fooled them, sir. We'll close to point-blank range and take them in succession. Are we ready, Mr. Bush? Clear and ready, sir. And strike that French flag and send up our own, Mr. Gerard. Sir. At her rigging, fire as you bear. Port battery. Fire as you bear. I think that even the least of our crew felt that we were destined for destruction. Yet not the least of them but thrilled at the sight before us. For this was something that most men under sail see only in their dreams. Four enemy ships helplessly entrapped, our guns pounding them to pieces. But our fire did not go unanswered. From stem to stern, we took their full fury. Keep firing, men! Give them another broadside! Mr. Carter reports the pumps are gone, sir. We can't stay afloat much longer. Get back to your post, Mr. Quist. Mr. Bush! Mr. Bush! Mr. Bush is wounded, sir. His leg, and they just in our port side battery. We're a fire forward, sir! Get your company together, Mr. Longley. Aye, aye, sir. Tie the wounded to anything that will float. Get them into the water. Chris, Saunders, give a hand there with Mr. Bush. Bash him well to a grating. Mr. Gerard. Yes, sir. Train one of your guns into the hole. Scoot around forward. If our ship's going to sink, we'll sink her where she'll do some good. Here in their channel. 
Standing by, sir. Ready to fire. Pass the word, abandon ship. Abandon ship. I'll wait, sir. Fire the charge. You'll obey orders, Mr. Gerard, and go over the side. I still know how to pull a lanyard. Very good, sir. Abandon ship. Oh! far from the shore. Most of us made it, the tide bringing in the wounded. They were waiting for us on the beach, French marines and soldiers. We were taken to a prison. Some hours later, Captain Hornblower joined us there. I can now tell you for certain that two of the French ships have sunk. The other two will never get through the channel. By nightfall, Admiral Layton and the squadron should be here. That means you'll all be free. Now, where's Mr. Bush? He's aft, sir, with the other wounded. I'll say this for the Frenchies, sir. They've done what they could for all of them. Oh, Mr. Bush. Oh, thank God you're safe, sir. How's your leg? In a scratch. When they come for us, I'll walk aboard. I've, uh, I've just been before their officers. You and I are to be taken to Paris. We're to stand trial as pirates. They'll be coming for us any moment. Pirates? <laughs> yes, sir. Begging your pardon, sir. Yes, what is it, Quist? Uh, Mr. Bush, uh, he's not fit to travel far without care, sir. I'd like to look after him, sir. Well, I can't allow you to do that, Quist. Why, within a few hours, you'll be on your way home with the rest of the men. I respectfully submit, sir. You won't hardly find a way of stopping me. Well, thank you, Quist. I'll, uh... I'll say goodbye to you now, men. For myself and Mr. Bush. It's not likely that we'll ever see you again. You know the England that you fought for. You know that you never need lose faith in her final victory. I want to thank you for the honor that you've bestowed on me by fighting at my side. A coach was waiting for us outside the prison. A colonel in charge and men on horses. There was a great haste to get us underway. Bush, how do you feel? Oh, it's not my leg that's worrying me, sir. It's knowing that you won't even try to make a break as long as I do. <laughs> I'm afraid he's delirious, Quist. He's talking sense, sir. There's just their colonel and the four men. I'll stick with Mr. Bush. No, it's all or none of us. Well, that's going to be a long journey. Suppose we all try to get some sleep. Sometime later, I became aware that we'd stopped. Quist was climbing back into the coach, and outside I could hear the French officer shouting at his men. Montez, montez! En voiture vite! Avant de coucher! Oh, what was wrong, Quist? I'm afraid I dozed off. Something wrong with their starboard wheel, sir. They didn't want to get their delicate hands dirty. No, it's dark out, eh? Aye, sir, and storming, too. You've been sleeping, sir. Are you all right, Bush? All I needed was a little rest. Just the same, Captain. I think we'd better keep a tight hold on him for a bit. That coach wheel. I made a terrible job of fixing it, sir. Ought to be flogged for it. How, uh, how bad a job, Quist? First good bump we hit, she's coming off. It'll be then or never, sir. It happened a few moments later. I remember the crash as the coach overturned, the screaming of the horses, the shouts of the Frenchmen. I must have struck my head, for to this day I do not know exactly what did happen. When my senses returned, we were lying in some bushes next to a river. Chris, look, he's coming around. Uh, how do I get here? Begging your pardon, sir. I carried you. Oh, Chris. Sir, how bad is it? I don't know. How's the leg? I've gotten all about that, sir. How did we get away? Well, when the wheels snapped, the horses broke their lines. That and the storm, some deplorable shooting, and here we are. And where might that be, sir? Now, this river is probably a tributary of the Loire. If we continue, we should eventually reach the port of Nantes. And after that, sir? Well, beyond that is the sea. Meanwhile, we'll need clothes for disguise and a boat to take us down the river. I never meant to tell you, sir, but before I joined the Navy, I served a term for theft. With your permission, sir, I, I'll do some reconnoitering. <laughs> well, be back before daylight, Quist. I will, sir, and I'll be coming back by boat. We floated down the river by night until we reached Nantes. There in the busy harbor, our chance of discovery lessened considerably. 
The wharves were crowded with ships of every description, but as we rode among the docks, one ship in particular took the captain's eye. Look at it, Bush. That dock ahead of us. What? What's the old witch of Indoor, sir? She went aground on the French coast two years ago. She looks seaworthy enough. But it'll take 20 men to handle her, sir. Set a course for that key, Mr. Quist. Aye, sir. I'm going ashore. He returned an hour later, full of information and in a great hurry to tell us. Now, there's no time to ask questions. Just listen closely. They're using the Witch of Endor to ferry supplies from here to San Nazar. She's waiting to unload now. There's only an anchor watch aboard, two hands and a master's mate. Three of them, sir, and three of us. We still need men to sail it to England, sir. Uh, on the other side of the key, Mr. Bush, they're using English prisoners for convict labor. They're building a seawall. But surely they're on the guard, sir. A sergeant and five men... Now, first of all, we'll walk aboard the Witch of Endor. And then, sir? Well, assuming that the three of us can dispose of the three of them, I will then employ my very best French and ask that sergeant of the guards to lend me his prisoners to unload the cargo. After that, we'll put our faith in God and 20 English prisoners. <laughs> I have often wondered since what went on in the minds of the lookouts on the shores of Plymouth when first they saw, they saw the Witch of Endor butting through the English Channel, full sails aloft, our signal flags cracking in the wind. Take your glass, Mr. Garvin, and look at those flags. She's asking permission to come into port. The Witch of Endor? Captain Horatio Hornblower? It's a trick of some kind. Get on the telegraph. Signal the naval station. There's time for that. But if your eyesight's good and I'm sober, there's a dead man approaching England in a lost ship. It is the witch. I'd know that old girl's beak head anywhere. Here, let me at the telegraph. Oh, oh blimey. Wait till those cock catch in town hear this. Lord Hood, sir. The message from the harbour lookout has just been confirmed, sir. It's the witch of Endor, sir. Witch of Endor? Is everyone in Plymouth drunk, Woodford? They've confirmed Hornblower, too, sir, in, in private code. All Plymouth's wild with excitement, sir. Plymouth? If it really is Hornblow, all England will go wild. We'll why you're standing about, man. Meet him when he lands. Bring him here. Gad, Hornblow, the only pleasure I seem to get from life these days is when you come home from one of your confounded voyages. <laughs> oh, thank you, my lord. May I call your attention to the very gallant behavior of my first lieutenant, Mr. Bush? And Seaman Quist. Indeed you may. Gentlemen, the greatest pleasure of an admiral is to reward good conduct. Mr. Quist, I'm promoting you here and now to boatswain's mate. Uh, I'm that obliged, my lord. And you, Mr. Bush, are now Captain Bush. If Leighton had known you were still alive, I'm sure he would have recommended it in his last report. His last report, sir? Oh, of course, you couldn't have known. Leighton was killed at La Teste. Great loss. We need all of our admirals if we're ever to finish this confounded war. Yeah, yes, my lord. Hornblower, you leave for London at once. Oh, I'm afraid I can't, sir. Can't? I wouldn't be surprised if there were a knighthood in it for you. Well, thank you, my lord, but I'd... Well, I'd like to see my son first. Oh, well, in that case, you'd better be off. Give him my coach, Mr. Woodford. Oh, thank you, my lord. <laughs> well, look at him, Mrs. McPhee. He's, he's grown so. I'd, I'd scarcely know my own son. He's grown with pride of you, sir, as have we all. <laughs> and he's so, he's so... Uh, begging your pardon, Captain, but she's waiting, sir, her ladyship. Don't she even see her? See her? Who? Where? <laughs> Our stars will return in just a minute. Walking, walking, waiting, waiting, dancing, dancing, dating, dating. Everywhere a lady goes, it's hard on stockings, hard on hose. Sitting, sitting, striding, striding, running, running, driving, driving. Everywhere a lady goes, it's hard on heels, hard on toes. One, two, one, two. Stretch, strain, stretch, strain. Everywhere a lady goes, it's hard on stockings, hard on hose. 
Scientific strain tests show that stockings washed the gentle Lux way last twice as long. That's why 90% of the manufacturers of nylons recommend Lux Care. So start the Lux Flakes habit this very night. Remember, Lux Flakes gives you double the stocking wear. It's like getting an extra pair with every pair you buy. Extra pair. Lux Care. Double wear. Lux Care. Lux. 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 And now here's Mr. Keeley with our stars. And we want to invite them forward for a well-deserved curtain call. Gregory Peck and Virginia May. <laughs> Greg, you've always been one of the busiest men in Hollywood with your screen, stage, and radio work. So what's new? Well, I've just returned from New York. I went to do a radio show, and I'm going right into another picture. And you, Virginia, what's going at Warner Brothers? This woman is dangerous. Is that a statement or a challenge? (laughs) (laughs) It's Joan Crawford's new picture in which she returns to a life of crime as the mastermind of a hold-up gang. Well, that is interesting news. Greg, didn't you finish a picture just before you went to New York? Yes, at Universal International. A world in his arms. A world in his arms. Well, now, I don't know about you, but if I were an actor, I'd prefer to have a Lux girl in my arms. <laughs> well, Bill, all the actresses I've played opposite have been Lux girls, just like Virginia. <gasps> That's right, Greg. I've been a devoted fan of Lux toilet soap for years. And I'm a devoted fan of the Lux Radio Theater. So what's for next week, Bill? Well, next week, an exciting drama. <clears throat> it's the Paramount picture hit, Branded. The story of an outlaw who attempts to pass himself off as the long-lost son of a wealthy rancher and then meets the beautiful girl who is supposed to be his sister. As our stars, three of everyone's favorites. Burt Lancaster, Mona Freeman, and Charles Bickford. I love the picture, Bill. Good night. Good night. Good night and hurry back. For a truly luxurious beauty bath, screen stars say there's nothing like Lux toilet soap in the big bath size. Blonde and Lux lovely Joan Fontaine says, I'm delighted with the generous bath size Lux soap. The active lather is so rich and creamy, and it leaves such a lovely flower-like fragrance on my skin. So try the satin smooth bath cake Joan Fontaine recommends. You'll love the way Lux lather creams up, abundant in even hardest water. And this gentle, active lather makes all your skin softer, smoother, looks lovely all over. Next time you shop, be sure to get this big, longer-lasting, bath-size Lux toilet soap. See for yourself why nine out of ten screen stars use Lux. Lux Toilet Soap Care is guaranteed by Lieber Brothers Company to give your complexion a fresher, smoother, lovelier look or your money back. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Burt Lancaster, Charles Bickford, and Mona Freeman in Brandon. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Heard in our cast tonight were Anthony Barrett as Mr. Bush, Charles Davis as Longley, Peter Owen as Quist, Dan O'Herlihy, as Gerard, and Jay Novello, John Dodsworth, Nelson Welch, Donald Morrison, Herbert Butterfield, Ruth Parrott, Fritz Feld, Irene Winston, Bill Johnstone, Jonathan Hole, Robert Griffin, Herbert Rawlinson, Stephen Dunn, and Eddie Marr. Our play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was directed by Rudy Schrager. This is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Branded... Starring Bert Lancaster.